Hello and welcome to the Infinite Backlog podcast. Hello. <laughs> I am Ricardo, uh, aka Kento, and I'm Todd, and that's what I'll be known as. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, this podcast is about our backlogs, uh, games of our past, present, and possibly future. And they just keep on coming. And they will keep, it will just keep on growing. <laughs> now, with our first podcast here, we are going to be talking about a game that's near to both of us. Near and dear to both of us, I should say. Uh, Banjo-Kazooie. Big nostalgia fest for me. Massive nostalgia fest. Grew up with it. And for you, it's kind of been a bit different, hasn't it, your opinion? A little bit, a little bit. Um, it's definitely a game I did play uh, as when it came out. My dad bought it. Uh, we had N64. I think it was one of the first games we had, along with like GoldenEye. That was a given for any N64. Oh um, yeah. Um, it's definitely a game I pl- I played, but I didn't get too far in. It was more of a game I watched because my dad played it. He got pretty far in it, uh, at least to my knowledge. He got pretty far in it. Uh, you, Todd, what's your experience? Well, I was quite lucky because when I was young, my uh, brother was in his teens and he was working, so he bought an N64. And he used to play uh, Banjo Kazooie late in the night when he got home from work, so he uh, worked at a hotel. And I used to be there, laid in my bed, and wake up and just like go over and sit next to him while he was playing it. So I'd be up all night, wake up in the morning, all grouchy and nice bright red eyes. So I had a lot of experience playing it with my brother, so for me, obviously, I've known it quite well over the years and that's why i hold it quite dear because it's uh childhood memories yeah and i've recently just played it and i can say it is a really really good game what what about what's sort of standing out to you again now that you've gone back to it uh standing out the camera's terrible <laughs> <laughs> um but good things let's go with the good things first uh good um it has a great just design altogether. How the how the levels flow and where you go, it's I never felt lost. I think I think it's all to do with every little area of a level has it's got like a different kind of like a different color scheme and design. Yeah, like it's all within the same theme, but there's lots of different sections within it, and it's very easy to tell apart all these areas. Exactly, there's there's little bits here and there. Um, I would say like Clanker's Cavern, you've got the main intro area. Then when you go into the water, you go into Clanker's Cavern. But that's not the end of it. You also have Clanker. There are three distinct areas, all within one level, that I can easily recall over and over again. And I never felt lost. I always felt like I knew exactly where I was going. And exploring the levels were was a lot of fun. Like, but that's the thing as well, it just... Even now, like there's a lot of th- games that feel quite dated, but some things, like you said, like do feel dated, like the camera. But it just feels kind of timeless in its design. It does. It's got beautiful level design. It's got lovely music. It's really colourful. It's always upbeat, no matter what. Yeah, it it definitely does feel. Um, it, there, it time has not slowed that game down at all, in my opinion. It's it, when I was playing it. Granted, it was kind of muscle memory, but I was je- definitely having like a genuinely good time and i don't play a lot of platformers uh especially recently i'm more of an action game uh kind of guy now but playing banjo kazooie again i just felt like wow this is great i knew exactly where everything was um personally for me sound design was phenomenal even for its time and with all the limitations that they had they made it stand out for you know compared to everything for me what i think stands out a lot as well is the music design because yeah. especially because you didn't really get dynamic audio in like the sort of a lot of the PS1 era, whereas with the N64, it was great they did it quite early on because you'd when you went into water, the sound changed in the music. Yeah. And all depending on where you were, if you were in an area that was sort of echoey, the sound changed. Like the music always changed depending on what environment you were in. It was all one level, but as soon as you went into a different place or you went underwater, the sound changed automatically. And yeah. it made it feel really dynamic, and it really drawed you in a lot better because it just all felt more natural. Oh yeah, um, I was telling you this before while I was playing it. Uh, that one main tune that they have in Banjo Kazooie uh, within Gruntil- uh, Gruntilda's lair, uh, I, 
don't remember the exact song. It is a classic tune, but that one tune, they use it, I believe, like seven times over, and they remix it two different areas of her lair. Uh, the intro, you've got the normal tune, the very familiar tune when you're um, at Mumbo's Mountain. It's the, you hear the termite, termites do that hop two, three, four, uh, along with the actual song. When you're go about to go into Clanker's Cavern, you've got that like tinny kind of sound, like it's going through a pipe. Um, for me, like I love games that do the they take one song but remix it over and over again. It always feels fresh to me. I always felt that, and that's also what the game does really well. All the levels feel really fresh. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, they all they're all completely different in their own way. Yeah, and that's that's what just that's what everyone is memorable for different reasons. Exactly. Uh, I personally have not gotten too far. The farthest I've gotten by myself is Freeze Easy Peak. I would say that's about halfway through the game. I'm not 100 percent on that. But more so. I think it's nine nine levels altogether, nine worlds. Yeah. So Freeze Easy Peak's like five, I think, fifth or sixth. Well, I've so, gotten relatively far in the game. Yeah. Now, personally, I've obviously, as you know, I've streamed it many, many times because yes. me and yourself both come from a long streaming background for oh, the past course. five years. <laughs> Think in that time, I probably streamed it about twenty times. And I've if watched not more. <laughs> I've watched a good deal of them. I've watched a good deal of it. Uh, I gotta say, it is one heck of a game when you go through collecting every little bit of it. It's not a very, it's not a short game. No, but that, short. that's that, well, it is and isn't depending on what, obviously, how well you know it. Yeah, I mean, if you go straight through the game, you just complete, you get the jiggies just required. It's you know, you'll complete it within a relatively quick time. But if you go collect all hundred notes in each level, collect each jiggy, uh, get all the jinjos, get every single honeycomb, the game can last you quite a while. See, I think for me, obviously I know the game really well, I don't speed run anything, but um, getting all jiggies and all notes, not all the honeycombs though, because I can never be bothered with that, don't, I don't need them, you know. <laughs> um, I think I've done about 6 hours 40 minutes, and that's on the European fifth, uh, PAL version at like 50 hertz, so it's a little bit slower. Mm, but you know so that you've played that game more. so many I, times. I've played it way too much, you know, it's just insane. But I still, I just still, no matter how much I play, I still love the characters. Yeah. Just all the little characters you have, and they're just so memorable. Like even at the end of the game, when you, before you have to fight Gruntilda, you've got um, oh, you've got that board game. <laughs> the board game. I've seen that, and that is insane. Oh, I love that thing so much, and it does like the character's voice thing. Like it's like you know, who has this voice? Oh. And. I love it, because all the characters, although they all sound the same, they all sound completely different at the same time, if that makes sense. Well, I think that's partly to do because it was such a small team, and I believe most of most of the voices are just the team members, and probably Grant Kurt Hope, you know, the guy who does music for, uh, uh, what's it called, Banjo-Kazooie? He actually does the yeah. voice of Mumbo. Yeah. Yeah, so. But that's, that's just like all the characters, they're just so good. Like you've got the uh, hippo in yeah. Treasure Trove Cove. Firstly, my favourite is the um, dolphin that's trapped in um, uh, Jolly Roger Bay. Is it Jolly Roger Bay? It's not Jolly Roger Bay, is it? No, that's no, Jolly the second Roger one. Bay's the second one. Yeah. What's it? Uh, Rusty Bucket Bay in uh, Banjo Kazooie. Rusty... Oh, oh, yep. How am I getting the two mixed up? I don't. I don't really like Tui. But that, that's for that's for another that's for another it's, conversation. Yeah, we're other. only it's only Banjo here, Banjo Kazooie here. So <laughs> we'll get the Tui. Uh, I've never gotten that far, so I vaguely remember the dolphin from your stream. Or um, Nabnut the squirrel from uh, Click Clock Wood. Click Clock Wood. So yeah. Um, because you get evil base. Have you, have you, you've not actually played all the thick wood, have you? You've no, just seen, seen I've just thing. seen you play that, and I don't know how, as a kid, I would be able to get through that. Because that whole See, seasons thing is insane for that game at the time. That's insane. That's what I loved about the design of it, though, is that you had the same world, but like you said, you love when they remix the sound, but they actually remix the level, and it was different for each season. Yeah. And it was very really nice. You saw the characters that were in the level in different states. And reacting differently, 
like at first you need help nabbing up by getting all like getting a load of nuts for them ready for the um winter and everything. And then when you find him he's just fat, he's just eating them all like too early and he's there fat, like can't even move. And then he needs to find more for him because it's just coming up to winter. You know, there's um uh what is it? It's uh Oh, I forgot the word now. It's not an otter, is it? It's the other one. But, beaver. But there's beaver. Yeah, it's a, that's the one. God, <laughs> I'm having a thick moment there. There's a beaver as well, and uh, his cave gets blocked, so you have to open his cave back up for him. And then if you go back in winter, the whole of the water that's at the bottom of the tree is frozen over, because you can only open up his home again for him in the summer when the water's gone. But it's all frozen over and you have to jump into freezing water and I know how much you hate losing your breath in Clanker's Cavern. Oh god. Yeah, it goes twice as quick. And you've oh, got to get to his Yeah, exactly. Oh. And you need to get into his um little hole in the tree, um, to see him and then he gives you a honeycomb piece as well. So it's little things like if you keep seeing the characters, you know, the progression it, of time or the false progression of time. Yeah, so yeah. through each season you get slightly different things. Yeah, I, it's, there's a lot of little things in Banjo Kazooie that I just I remember and see and see as I was playing. It's just like it's it's nice to see that. Yeah, you know, Lots rare rare where at that time was a fantastic company when it came to like creating platformers. They did like these little things. And if you go into the history of like Banjo Kazooie and what they wanted to do and what they did, it it's huge. It's crazy. It's it's amazing that they even got the game done. Well, that's why they ended up doing a sequel, and they did so much more. Yes. Um. But again, that's for another podcast. Well, but yeah, of course. Let's talk about the bad, because <laughs> there are a couple of things that I feel are amazingly bad. <laughs> uh, like I said before, the camera is. I understand what it was for. Um, it was really adapting to the controller, and for the controller, that's fine. But playing on an emulator with a Xbox 360 controller, I was constantly trying to center the camera in ways that I'm used to with normal gaming conventions, and I hated it. In all fairness, at some points it can still be pretty frustrating when playing on the N64 to get the camera lined up properly. Yes. Um, admittedly the camera is pretty poor but then if you look at modern day examples like Metal Gear Rising that problem still exists in quite a lot of games oh yeah it's still it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny that it's still a problem within many games camera is just an issue but yeah. I feel in Banjo-Kazooie it's just my issue is that it's slow like the R button is supposed to center your camera it does but it takes a little bit I'm used to more of an instant like here you are on your back kind of camera quick snap sort of yeah thing. snapping kind of deal with banjo kazooie it does take a little bit and when you're running around like say in a circle and you try to center the camera the camera will try to center itself but it'll also stay at a fixed position while you're running and that can be sort of an issue when you're in a tight situation yeah it can't keep up yeah it definitely can't keep up uh, another issue i had was the swimming controls clanker's cavern was <laughs> a pain for me it was just so hard to unlock like Clanker. Clanker was ah, uh, it was such a pain just to just to try to get myself at the right angle to either collect notes, collect air bubbles, or just try to unlock the key. It was such a pain. See, don't get me wrong, I do understand those pains, but the thing is why I've played it so much, it's harder for me to see it because I just know it. If that makes sense, I, I just know it and I don't know anything else like when I play it and I get back used to the controls I just pick it all up again so for me it's harder for me to notice many of the flaws it is for you because obviously I I'm so used to them that I don't notice them you're right uh, I can I can I can completely understand with that um, another issue I feel um, is <laughs> I sense you've got a nice long list of these. I, I'm, I'm a, loving it. I'm loving I've, it. <laughs> I've got a couple. I've got a couple. Um, <laughs> this is my big. Like this is a big one uh, for me. Uh, boss battles. There is a serious. Like I'm not saying every platformer needs to have a boss battle. Some some platformers can do wonderful without boss battles. But Banjo Kazooie has a problem with pacing when it comes to bosses. 
th oh. there is none. Like there pretty much is no boss battles or what I would class them. I suppose in Mumbo's Mountain you might class what's it Conga or whatever. Conga, name is. yeah, Conga, Congos, the the big yeah. ape. Yeah, can 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 that actually be classed as a boss? I don't I, know. I would consider it a boss battle because it requires you have to defeat him to get a jiggy. Granted, he's yeah. not he's not like hurt or anything. He's just like, oh, you beat me. Here you go. You know. But I think that's part of the friendly intro to Banjo as well, though. That like True. that goes with the flow of the game. Of, you know, it's all quite friendly. True. Um, but then after that, after what that, have you got after that, There's, you've got I Nippers, the uh, Hermit Crab. See, I wouldn't class that as a boss personally. It's just see, for what I class a boss, I class it as a large encounter. But it or is something that it takes reasonable time. That's three hits. But then I suppose that was traditional Nintendo style. Obviously it was rare, but you know what I mean. Yeah. That was traditional platformer style, wasn't it? The whole three, three and done kind of thing. Three and done. Yeah. You have nippers. Um, I you've believe... got Cranker's Cavern. You've got all the crabs in there as well. There's that one room, like the fight. Yeah. That could be class a boss fight. Yeah, it does. It technically does. And I feel like the bosses. They do a very a boss battle to me is supposed to introduce you to some sort of mechanic, or at least a mechanic pertaining to that boss. And uh, it's supposed to either help you improve as a as a player, or just continue. And I just feel like Banjo Kazooie places bosses here and there as just here's here's a issue that you have to solve so you can get a jiggy. And I don't I don't feel as big a big of an accomplishment. Uh, as I would with, let's say, like, Mario, you know? Well, I think what it is, well, it's not just the pacing, it's literally the placing of it. Yeah. I, oh, they are larger encounters, and personally I wouldn't class them as a boss, but that might be because they're more embedded in the level rather than being at the end of said level. True, that's true. Do you know true. what I mean? Like, you know, you can take on the nipper guy until you want, you can just go kill those crabs in the kind of cavern, or wherever they are, whenever you want. Do you know what I mean? They're not placed at the end to, as stopping you from getting somewhere else. Yeah. A boss is normally something that's progression based and it stops you from being able to progress. Whereas in that, if you didn't fight the, any of the bosses and get the jiggies from them, it doesn't matter, you can still get enough to finish the game. True. So, to me they're just a lot of, an encounter, like a mob, rather than, you know, a, a threatening enemy or boss, if that makes sense. It makes sense, but my biggest issue is when you get to the end of the game, um, which I've seen you do. It's it's to me it seems jarring because you're fighting this this is a boss. You're fighting a boss that has a pattern and everything, and up to that point you have fought nothing like Bruntilda. And I it seems like it's just it's just this jarring thing, you know? Yeah. You, you play no this whole point. game. That's all with platforming, uh, collecting all this stuff, and then, bam, a boss that kind of tests you in a completely different way the game has been teaching you. Yeah, because there the, no point to the game test your skill set, so not necessarily specifically, like, targeted at a boss, if you will. Yes. Like, you know, you have to use the flying bomb thing on her. I always forget what it's called. The, uh, the dive bomb kind of skill with the yeah. Kazooie, yeah. Yeah, but the only time you actually use it in the game is occasionally you have to use it to take out the snowman. Yes. And then you've in Freezy Peak you hit the buttons on the snowman. Yeah, but even the snowman, you they're completely, you can completely uh, pass over them. You don't have to hurt them if no, my no, memory exactly. Is. There's only like only if you want the witchy switch or something you have to kill one of them on. Well, you have to kill one on um, Freezy Peak, and then there's one in the winter part of Click Clock Wood, and they're both on witchy switches, and that's it, right? Other than that, you don't need to kill them, but even then, like, they do move a little bit, but then when you have to dive bomb Gruntilda and she keeps moving, yeah, granted she does stop, but you need to be able to control your flying enough to be able to turn around and everything when you know she's stopping and stops casting to be able to time it right and, you know, attack. Like, so I understand your frustration, your point there, that you don't get any other time to use these skills properly for least, what you need. At least to test your skill yeah. um, before you face Gruntilda. Yeah. Granted, Gruntilda is technically an optional boss. After you after you save Tootie, 
and you do the board game, you don't technically have to fight Gruntilda at all. Well, that is true. You do get a form of credits, but you don't get the real credits. No, you don't, but to some people, if I was a kid and I played the game, if I got up to that bit, I think I would be done. I think I, would, I wouldn't think anything of the credits and be like, okay, I'm done, yay. Yeah, but at the end of the credits, says Gruntilda's getting away. Go get her. You're right. <laughs> so, you know, but, there's still more to do. But you have to wait for the credits to roll, and I think as a kid, I would turn off the game at that moment. And <laughs> You're I like, didn't realize. this is done. I'm turning it off. <laughs> yeah. I didn't complete many games on the N64 as a kid. Um, I played a lot of them. I played a good deal of my N64 games, but I never completed any of them. See, it's just those fake credits. They annoy me, but I love them at the same time because they go back to all the characters, and it just make, it just makes you laugh because they've all got such weird names and that, and you know they it's it's just interesting. And then you know when you actually beat Gruntilda and you get the real ending, you're then told there's more to do, and this is where it really bugged me, right? You're told about this uh, shop and swap or stop and swap, whatever they call uh, it. Stop, the about. infamous stop and swap. That's yeah, and you can't even do anything with it. I remember collecting a load of the eggs when I was a kid. You could collect three, I think it was two or three. I don't. I there can't was say. there's one in Treasure Trove Cove in the tower that comes out of the water. Mm. There's one in Gobi's Valley, and some you have to do something that appears in the maze um, tomb. Um, and it's above the like the sarcophagus, whatever it is. Um, I can't remember where one of the other ones is. I remember getting at least like, there was like two or three, but then you couldn't even do anything with it. Um, I know there was a they hinted at the ice key, but there's no way to actually get the ice key, right? I don't believe so. I don't know. I'm not sure. I can't remember. That's the thing. I, I for some reason I seem to remember getting it when I was a child, but when I look up online now about how to get it, they say you can only get it if you glitch or you uh, if you um like use an emulator and you cheat and you go over the wall. I yeah, I don't think you can get the ice key. I no, mean, there's but... an egg where the ice key is, I think. Yeah, so that I... might be. But uh the, we, that... we've, I must say, we probably sound like right idiots right now because we don't actually know everything about it and we're sat here talking about it. Hey, we're, the podcast is only strictly about our past experiences with the game. I'm oh, not saying I'm a professional at banjo I, I just thought it was quite funny because I'm sat here like meant to know what I'm <laughs> on about. I've played it so much. I'm like, I actually haven't got a clue. <laughs> but I've been talking about my impressions, my issues. What about you? What, what have you felt about well, the toughest game. thing for me is the camera. Um, for me, like that, that has not aged well, and that is it. But like I said, I've learned it. The, the biggest gripe I've got with Banjo Kazooie isn't with the N64 version, and this is me gonna sound really weird now. It's with the 360 version. <laughs> all right, it's fair. It's fair. It's the. It's, it's technically the same game. It's all fair. Yeah, but the reason being is that on the N64 version, just so you collect 80 notes in a level and you die, you need to recollect them all and the final 20 to get your note score of 100. Whereas if you die in a level on the 360 version, it, you keep your notes. Like, if you go back in the level, there's only 20 left. You don't have to recollect them. It saves your progress. Now, that might sound stupid to some, but I find that part of the fun. I find that part of the challenge. Yes, it's not a terribly hard game, but it's nice to be able to play through the whole game and have to go through an entire level without dying to be able to get all the notes. It's like an extra challenge to it. Yeah. And that's what I find enjoyable. It gives you something else to do. In a way, it kind of makes you committed, you know? Like, when you get those notes, you're committed to getting 100 notes or at least getting your highest score of notes. Exactly. Like... It just adds another layer to it in some ways that you never would have considered when you were younger and you played it. No. Because there wasn't another option of playing it. Yeah. Whereas now, if you play a 360 version, you could die with like 50 or 60 notes, and it's you, it's no skin off your nose because it doesn't matter because you've already got them. There's no like normally when you die, there's some sort of punishment in the game in some way, like you lose a bit of progress or you know something like that. There's no. There's no, there's no consequence of losing. Exactly. That's, that's the thing. 
And that's that's my biggest issue with it is the fact that the game's been made. What I don't, what doesn't make sense in my head is that people say games are getting easier these days, and I don't defend that because to an extent I some yes, but I also think some no because games have multiple difficulty options and people just opting to play it on the easiest. You can always make a game harder for yourself. I do it all the time for fun. You do. But, you know, like, with that, they have just gone with the trend of what everyone's saying. They actually made the game easier. Like, there's no option for it. It is just easier. Like, I, I can't fathom that in my own mind. I don't understand why that would need to be done or why that option needs to be made to change the game. I can't really say. Rareware, as of recent, has not been the best company. No, no shit. <laughs> But... I'm, I'm sorry, Even not even as of recent, after the N64, they weren't the best company. We know what came out of them on GameCube. <laughs> I, 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 stand, I stand very firm on saying Star Fox 64, uh, not 64, Star Fox Adventures isn't that bad of a game. It's a bad game. Any game that ends in yiffing is a bad game. <laughs> Believe oh <God>. me. <laughs> I didn't think we'd ever talk about that. I thought it was about games. <laughs> I, I, I I thought that was a nice thing to slide in near the end, you know. Oh god. On the topic of rare and uh, animals. And yeah, what is it with rare and making games with animals? <laughs> I know they did Goldeneye and Perfect Dark, but they've done Banjo Kazooie and Star Fox Adventures. I bet it was like a marketing thing. I, it has to be something. Game sell with cute animals. Uh, I remember what's it called? Uh, Conquer's Bad Fur Day originally was supposed to be a very kitty game. Uh, their response to people saying, "Oh, it's another kitty-friendly game with fur furry animals," was what we get now. It's Con Conquer's Bad Fur Day. See, you say that as well, but did you ever notice there's quite a lot of like, like that playing Banjo Kazooie now? Actually, it reminds me. There's quite a lot of adult humor in it. Like, oh yeah. The oh. interaction between Banjo and Sue, there's so much sarcasm and stuff in there that you don't pick up as a kid, you just think it's a joke and stuff. When you actually really sort of read it and that and even though the voices don't mean anything, there's a tone in the sounds. Yes. And it just goes so well and it just makes you think, Wow, like especially playing it as an adult, like you pick up on it. I still find that stuff funny because there's loads of little things. And like even right at the end of the game, like in the final ending um, when they're on the beach, There's that girl walks past. She's carrying a tray with two melons on, and they're right in front of a, like, a you know, a chest. Right, right. Oh, come on. Could have yeah, said exactly. right in front of her melons. Come on, come well, on. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the punchline. Play it up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like there's there is actually quite a bit of adult humour in Banjo Kazooie that you don't see as a kid. No, you don't. Um, it's one of those. It's like when you watch like rewatch the Looney Tunes or those old cartoons pick up on things and that's really it's it's definitely part of the fun of going back to banjo kazooie there's a lot of fun, like even though i explained a lot of problems with the game i had a great time just replaying it and i will probably continue to play it to the end i may finish it this time around granted if nothing gets in the way just just enjoy all the adult undertones that you never noticed as a child no no but it seems like we're <laughs> about to end here uh our little recollection of Banjo Kazooie. I was uh, going to call it a rant, if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> a rant, whatever you want to call it. Um, we will continue our next podcast with a game I kind of hold more dear to my heart, and you hate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Would be Banjo Tooie. This uh, is we'll be back in two weeks, isn't it? Two weeks of this podcast being posted. We'll oh, continue. Yeah. <laughs> this <laughs> shall be a good time. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening, and have a good day, guys. See you guys later. <laughs>